And in this uh, summer school, <coughs> so specially dedicated on the energy efficient IA, embedded IA, I will explain why. And uh, so hello also people that are online. <coughs> Welcome also. So I, I will uh, start this presentation, this opening with the presentation of the lab, IMS. So IMS stands for uh, integration from material to system. So as you can <coughs> see, there is a, a broad subject and uh, research axis. So first of all, First of all, so there is three administration um, association with the laboratory, meaning that there is several people coming from the University of Bordeaux, Bordeaux INP, which is the, uh, the engineering school, electrical engineering school, and also CNRS, which is a national institute in France. So we have also uh, several <coughs> buildings, but where we stand, us, it's the main one. So the, the two horses are related to the uh, organic group and also to the cognitive group, science, cognition science. But apart from that, the main building is here and uh, overall it represents uh, many, many uh, meters square of rooms, dedicated platforms, etc etc so you will um, be in one of them and i will show you where exactly um, besides so we are roughly uh, 400 people working together in ims so it could be a teacher researcher uh, phd student postdoc engineer research engineer etc etc administrative people for sure so uh, all together uh, we represent we are working for several kind of uh, approach of the research so as you can see here first of all it is engineering and technology so this is important because when we uh, talk about uh, artificial intelligence usually it stands for uh, software but it's not the purpose here it's really hardware technology also we tend to uh, integrative system approach this is normal because of the title of the laboratory and uh, what is important also for us it's not only integration of hardware it's also integration of knowledge integration of intelligence and uh, know-how in between us. And, and for the, the rest, let's say that uh, currently uh, IMS laboratory uh, leads and uh, work on several rounds, depending on Europe, national and uh, overseas also. So we, we have uh, several kind of research typology. So IMS uh, is, um, features a really um, important uh, dif different uh, research axis from the bottom to the top. It is what we call the continuum of, of research. So as you can see at the bottom, there is uh, some kind of material research, which is dedicated most of them from the organic so non-organic like silicon is is not the purpose of this group and at the end of uh, the research uh, continuum there is the bioelectronics so this is inter interaction with the biology so and also to mimic the biology so all <coughs> over this continuum there is 10 groups and what is important for us today and for the rest of the week is the interaction that we we will have together about so first of all nanoelectronics so as you can see in in this um, graph there is bubbles and the size of the bubbles represents the number of key works in in the in the uh, the article the conference etc of this group and the link between the bubbles represents the keywords that are linked together 
Okay, so as you can see, there are several type of keywords, but the, the main and the, the important one is uh, modeling and also terahertz for this group. Also, the circuit design, it will, it will be a large part of this summer school. The circuit design is also very important in this summer school. So as you can see, there are several um, keywords that are important. For instance, so substrate, CMOS integrated circuits, that's for sure. And last, but not least, the bioelectronics group, where you can, you can see that human and neurons, spiking neural network, etc., is a very important subject in this group. So all together, we also share some dedicated platforms and you will uh, be able to uh, have some hands-on on one of them, which is called NanoCom, Nano for nanoelectronics and Com for communication. So you will uh, um, experience some training on, on this uh, platform yourself. So to come to uh, this uh, summer school, so why energy efficient um, embedded IA? It is because most of the time, uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we um, see behind this loss of uh, software. But for us, it is important to remind you that uh, behind this, there is the fundamental machine. We exchange lots of data between the, the memory core and the computing core. So it's not at all dedicated. It's not um, the way of doing for neural networks. So we have to reinvent all the value chain from the technology to the application and in between there is the uh, neural networks. So why here in Bordeaux and in IMS? <laughs> It's because in 2021, uh, we have started three European projects. It was roughly around the same thing. T talking about the technology, dedicated technology to the application and in between how to do that using neural networks or artificial intelligence. So for one of them, which is called Full Monty, so it's the acronym of Ferroelectric Vertical Low Energy, Low Latency, Low Volume Modules for Neural Network Transformers in 3D. Transformers are dedicated uh, neural networks and especially really efficient for the natural language processing. The second one is a radio spin, so deep oscillatory neural networks computing and learning through the dynamics or of RF neurons interconnected by RF uh, spintronic synapses. And the third one, the last one is Hermes, highly versatile radio for communicating artificial intelligence for 6J bands and beyond. So this, is, this was just to introduce how all these summer schools start. And to focus on something very important, in every, in these three projects, the emerging technologies, uh, we think that they are game changer for neural networks, which represents the, the, the future of the embedded IA. Embedded IA meaning that we need to be energy efficient, to be embedded in uh, every IoT system. So to start with, uh, Full Monty, for instance. So um, the purpose was to start from a vertical technology, so nanowires, to invent the uh, logic cell that goes together, to inv and with this invent what we call N2C2, which stands for Compute Cube, Neural Network Compute Cube, and to, to get this neural network system and the application was is um, to translate something 
in here, for, for instance, I am French and I could speak French and you can be from another country with another language and we can exchange like this. Understand each other without um, exchanging uh, from the internet. So this is, this is the purpose. To do that, we particularly, we, we know that uh, everything that could be uh, reinvent should feature something like the biological neural network. It means that what you see here, it's very simple. It's a weighted sum followed by an activation function. Really simple, and we know how to do that. But to be efficient, neural networks needs to, to be dense. The, the number of those cells are really important. This is why it has to be uh, inside a matrix. The, the, new, the natural way of doing of neural networks is a matrix one, and the more efficient is a 3D matrix. This is why inside this project, we, we have two loops. The first loop um, investigate the uh, DTCO loop, so design, technology, design, loop from, so the transistor by itself, vertical technology, its characterization, and then um, its virtualization inside um, a dedicated software, and then the into C2 design, and then we can go around like this to optimize everything. And the second loop is the link with the, the uh, application. So this is the hardware software optimization loop. Okay, so uh, this program is linked to uh, the summer school through four parts. For instance, the technology fabrication. So we will have a nice talk from Sylvain. The electrical characterization. So uh, Shandak and Marina and Magali uh, will take over this. The 3D uh, TCAD flow simulation. So some friends from uh, GTS tools will um, handle this. And finally, we have the, the system exploration, and we will have some talk on Friday uh, with the Jamfa bags. What about the rest? Yeah, so uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Adrien Vincent, and I'm uh, involved in the Radio Spin project that I will just uh, briefly describe here. Um, so the Radio Spin project has a it has radio in its name. It's related to radio frequency system. And the idea is to see <coughs> emerging nano devices that are radio frequency elements as building blocks for a new generation of hardware neural networks that would be able, for example, to use those nano devices uh, at the same time as neuron, nano neurons, and also as nano synapses, which are both the two main core elements of a neural network. And uh, something really interesting in that project is that you can exploit the physics of those nano devices to perform some of the calculation of the computing that you need in a neural network. So in particular, uh, this afternoon, you will have a nice talk by uh, Dr. Uh, Mizrahi, which is here, about this kind of technology. And from an application point of view, one of the main advantages or uh, key features of, those of this approach is that you could imagine processing raw RF signals without having the need to uh, dig digitizing them before uh, any kind of computing on, on those signals because the system is able to process raw RF inputs. Okay, And so, for example, the, um, the applications that we are working on in the context of uh, radio spin uh, are um, uh, RF fingerprinting, fingerprinting of uh, drone emissions, for example, or uh, we also have a collaboration with a small uh, S with an SME in Italy about uh, mammography technology. They have some kind of mammography uh, system that uh, perform an RF image uh, of the of the breast, and they try to uh, see if you you have uh, cancerous cells or not. Okay. And we are see in the radio spin project if we can 
help them having better accuracy in terms of detection. Okay. And uh, we, so with Sylvain uh, Saidi here, we have another um, project that is related to those kind, to that idea of uh, studying the hardware that is required for building energy efficient uh, neural networks. But it's some kind, it's a different approach from radio spin. So it's radio spin, we are focused on radio frequency signals. And in the context of the green AI uh, project, uh, it's more related to what's called even based computing, where you have uh, sparse information, which reduces the quantity of data that you have to process, which means usually that you have also less, you require less energy. Okay. Uh, and in that context, you will have uh, typically a, a lecture by uh, Sylvain and I on Wednesday, and also almost a full day of, um, of uh, hands on project on a simulator of this kind of spiking neural network architectures uh, to see how you can um, try to leverage that idea of having less data, which leads to a uh, lower, um, lower energy consumption for your algorithm. But you also need usually to adapt everything else that you already need in terms of uh, information processing, because the representation of the information in, is so different from what uh, algorithm people are used to that you have somehow to reinvent most of the of the elements okay um that's it uh, about it and now i will leave the floor to uh, francois yes. oh yeah so that, that's what i, I just yeah, said yeah, so you just told us yeah so you can skip it okay i'm um, francois Ivey. so this is the phone you don't have in your hand <laughs> who has 5g in his phone i have 5g you have 5G? Yes? Yes. So uh, in this week, you will learn why we cannot go uh, to 6G without rethinking completely what we have done in 5G. The thing you have, you have not, uh, not all of you, you may have uh, 4G. And we have created a new technology for 6G by investigating a new chip. So the chip is the technology, and it's CMOS technology, which is the horrible one to make a circuit. So we take the worst, and we will add artificial intelligence to uh, be energy efficient and to access the spectrum to match the, um, the 6G. And it's going to use some mathematics. You love mathematics, of course, because you are here studying science. Yes, it's great mathematics. You'll see it's 0 and 1. That's, that's great. And then we'll investigate some sub frequency, very high, that can be fearful, but we'll see that it works. So how it's going to be done? It's like a recipe, French recipe. You mix what together? The CMOS technology? And then with some AI there, with European uh, founders and mathematics. And at the end, you have the 6G. This is what Hermes is going to do. You will investigate some techniques around that project. It's very advanced, but we make it easy for you. We will learn design technologies and how chips are fabricated and measured here in a research lab. And that's why I'm going to say again and again, CMOS, AI, and WASH, WASH, are the mathematics we're going to use. So how it's going to be done here? Three main lectures you have there. The uh, first one will be uh, tomorrow afternoon, just after lunch. You will learn to design your first circuits. I don't know if some of you have already designed some integrated circuits, but you learn during three hours, step by step, to put some transistors. Then uh, after, it's Wednesday, we have a whole lecture the morning about 6G. Why, how? How it's going to change? Plus, I have added some very um, important people in our history that make the communication through the cell phone we have in our hand. So, if you don't know who is Marconi, Hilbert, or whatever, I will tell about their life. Uh, even uh, um, Greta Thunberg. Yes, she's famous for certain music. <laughs> and the last one, same. You will put your hands on the table to see how you can apply artificial intelligence to improve the efficiency of your smartphone. If you have a long call, it's hot there. Do you feel it? Yes, thanks to artificial intelligence, it won't be hot anymore. And you will understand why, that's true. And it will start today, and just after the first talk with Emilio there, who is gonna talk about the 6G he envision to make it feasible. Thank you.
Okay, this is the uh, timetable of the week. So we will have lectures. So it will be uh, today, right after the opening session. You will have some uh, hands on session also and some uh, experience uh, with uh, on prop measurement as well. You will have some explanation from different kind of application, vision, natural language processing, and the associated neural networks that goes, that are the best goes with this. And uh, finally, we will uh, have uh, very interesting uh, social events that I will talk later with uh, Francois. So this is just right now, but you will have also powerful and efficient computing systems, <coughs> emerging, emerging device modeling and simulation, complex integration circuit design and analysis, communication, telecommunication evolution with IA, novel parameter extraction methods and theory, novel parameter extraction methods experimentation and uh, spiking neural networks the introduction embedded artificial intelligence application first lecture and the set uh, on on also on the spiking neural networks parameter simulations <coughs> computing system performance evaluation stream lining and power uh, amplifier non-linearities and this will be the end but before that we will have some social events three of them so it's really important to say that <laughs> summer school is not about only uh, only about science uh, who is not french not french not french i am french so okay so we have a majority of people who is not french maybe the first time in france i guess and online also maybe coming from uh, from India, especially we have one third of our uh, attendees, uh, virtual attendees from India. So you are here to discover also the culture of French and of France. And we start tonight at the Mama shelter on the rooftop. The weather will be so so, but be sure that it's gonna be covered uh, for the, from the rain. You have here the address, very easy to find. It's downtown. Downtown, there is only one tram stop. The trams start from there. It's Hotel de Ville, that means City Hall. This is where you have the Cathedral of Bordeaux. You cannot miss it, it's huge. And you walk just 100 meters from there, and then you have the Mama Shelter. Rooftop means that you have to take the elevator, go to the rooftop, only one direction for that. Really you easy. You have your tram ticket with you. And you have the tram yeah. ticket offered, yes, yes, yes. It can work for the whole week. Anyway, there are some students from here, so they, they will leave you. So we will have dinner together. Raise your, uh, your hands. And <laughs> so Luca, Ifang, and Usam. Don't be afraid. So to talk each other, we have our names there. So I don't have my glasses, but you tell me your name, and I, it will be a pleasure to exchange with you. I I want to know where do you come from and why you came there. Also, we have uh, it's uh, Thursday. It's very nearby to the rooftop Mama Shelter, so you will know the place. It's just close to the tram station. We have uh, Café Français. Uh, what could be more French than that? <laughs> it's a pure French restaurant, Parisian style. Yes, you know, with the waiter, they are not happy and they serve you, but good food. Okay. <laughs> it's in the World Heritage uh, downtown of Bordeaux. So you can discover the monuments, etc. And then same, you, have, you are here to relax and to exchange about the, the week. We always start with a cocktail. That's a tradition in France. Uh, it's uh, beer, wine, whatever, and then we have the three-course uh, dinner. About the lunch, as you have seen today, uh, you have a lunch, so here it was more like a buffet, but tomorrow it will be served in the lab and with uh, a three-course, but lighter than tonight, uh, meal, okay? Same, we will sit next together and we will exchange, we'll discuss. It's a one-hour break, it's quite short for French, uh, but maybe quite long for others who are not used to have the French style of of lunch so it's on site it's french gastronomy and it's going to change every day so every day you have a different lunch and we have a farewell lunch friday so don't leave the summer school we before don't. the lunch because we will go to a restaurant nearby which is called bistro region uh if you like meat and potatoes that's perfect uh 
speciality from Bordeaux. And if you are vegetarian, they have also many things to offer. So <coughs> we will have a last lunch together. This is the map. So here, you can see the color is red everywhere. We are living from Petsoto, which is a tram stop uh, nearby there. I think you came from Dorian Bruce this morning. Then we go to Hotel de Ville downtown, and you see the two places there on the map. They are very nearby. Cathedral Saint Andre is the main cathedral of the city. Last but not least, we would like to thank a lot IEEE, uh, CAS, Circuit and System Society. They are sponsoring uh, these events, and uh, this is very successful as we've received 107 virtual attendees uh, who are registered from. 37 institutes you have here the list so it's not only friends the only few are from france but we have a large participation from india maybe they are sleeping right now i don't know if they are online uh, and from south america i, I guess so thank you a lot for ipoli cast if you want if you are not still a member of ipoli this is really important and if you are still for 10 dollars on 10 dollars you can subscribe to the major the main the only one community in the world about electronics engineering. We count 400,000 members. This is the main one. So for only ten dollars, you can be a member and you can benefit from a reduction. You can subscribe to the whole content of the papers you know you have online. You don't need to go on Sci-Hub. And yes, you know what is Sci-Hub, okay? Uh, and do that. No, 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 with IEEE, you pay ten dollars. That's it. You have access to everything. So because you're a student, because you are a student, of course. So we have uh, other students there. They can show you in three clicks how to pay ten dollars. Mm. Thank you very much, Archibald Gas. Thank you very much to atel all attendees online for this <coughs> opening, and thank you uh, very much for all of you. Okay. So let's start with the first uh, lectures. Hello, Miko. Pourquoi je ne peux pas me poser? Ah non, c'est Stéphane. Hi. Good on the video for a moment. We, we change the PC. Tu en restes sur celui-là, c'est plus simple. On va pas sur celui-ci pour le moment. Je pense qu'il y a un problème avec le... 
Ah oui, non, c'est bon. Est-ce que tu peux mettre le bandeau ah, Le bandeau, c'est bien ça. Merci de la vie voilà. vidéo. Et le bandeau, tu peux le mettre en bas. Comment ça Le bandeau zoom. Vous en voulez un Non, non. Je ne sais pas. Ça pas l'air. Il faut juste cliquer. Cliquer sur les. Ou avec le. So, thanks first of all to organizer to invite me here for this talk. My name is Emilio Calvestinati. <coughs> I work at Civality, which actually is a, is a research center in France, which has about 16,000 researchers working on different branches of, uh, say, uh, scientific intelligence. And uh, in particular, I'm taking care directly the keys on CG, uh, so next generation wireless communication systems ranging from hardware to also more algorithmic, theoretical, and also software design. So the title of this presentation is something that uh, it's also meant to give an introduction about why we are doing all these things with artificial intelligence from a macro point of view. Actually, toward CG, toward the next, genera next giant lab for AI with semantic communication. So we'll insist a lot on this new paradigm of semantic communication, and you will understand why. In 1926, the Biran Tesla stated when the wireless is perfectly applied, the whole orb would be converted into a huge brain. By 2030, year where we foresee to have CG operational and respond to the fundamental human and social needs, this promise might become a reality. Having new services we actually will base on the use and adoption of AI and also to the collaboration between different elements of AI around the globe. Among different services that we're going to have in CG, I'll let this is one who's really a concern about AI, is actually as what we call the semantic service. So those actual services that are meant to support the interaction uh, between artificial intelligence, also natural intelligence, where you share knowledge. So it's the new paradigm of service where you have not only the connected things, you know, all this IoT that you heard about, but also you connect intelligence. And to connect intelligence again, what you do, you really share a new type of information, which is knowledge. There are different possible uh, applications we see today, I think that we are still not in 2030, so we have time for that. But actually, the metaverse, where actually what you share indeed is some information, not to reconstruct an experience. You don't need to share exactly bit by bit what's happening from one side to another. What we call sensational services, like for example, you do shopping and you have on the e-shopping and you have the feeling of the touch, you have the smell and so on. Everything is about haptic and empathic communication. And I would say in general, any type of bi-directional cyber physical systems where you have two side virtual or uh, real or actually have interaction. So this, all this AI, Actually, it's coming to a cost, a very important cost. I guess you heard already about this exponential growth of data going through the network. Actually, if you look at the projection, we think that about in, a, in by 2030, about 20% of the overall uh, uh, energy consumption will be due to data flowing to network for AI and you know, also on devices. 
So this trend, which actually is the trend we have been experiencing in the last 25 years, you know, this growth of you know, user data, user data, actually it's something that we can say is not definitely sustainable. At the same time, we cannot consider to stop using technology. I mean, this is a fully regression society. So the real question that we have in engineering is actually how to find sustainable growth. To answer this question, one of the approach, actually you will see a lot here in this days, that you find technology that consumes much less energy, has a much less uh, uh, footprint on technology. But there also another question is, do we really need to send all this data around? Can we do it in a more smart way? So I, I did a, a free calculation considering <clears throat> when you use AI for a communication system, only the cost of the energy associated for the communication part. And then just a small processing for optimizing optimization, the, the, the communication. This, what I will show you here, does not include all the rest of the costs you directly have with AI when you use AI. And actually, if you see what we had in the, in the, in the previous generation, we have a, uh, so if you, if you look here, the graph is actually showing the, the kilowatt per hour per gigabyte, so much energy you spend per, per amount of data you send in the network for the different generation, 2G, 3G, 4G, et cetera. And actually, up to 2020, I have measure numbers, okay? And let's consider at the, at the end of, two, uh, of 4G, we really start having a kind of introduction of machine learning. So not, not let's call it AI, but machine learning to have an impact uh, on the network for, for which you see that actually this energy field, this cost per database change because it would change the type of machines we use. We're using more general purpose machines, not specified machines for, for which at the end the cost change. And actually, if you stop the energy efficiency we have over on the network for dealing with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the data we have to, to send, and actually, so assuming that we freeze the energy efficiency uh, capacity ability we have in 2020, then actually in 2020, we will need to cover the entire surface of Mexico with the photovoltaic panels in order to feed all this energy. Then you could go to 2025, 20, you will need because actually the data is growing. You will need to, to cover the entire surface of, um, of uh, Australia, 2030, North America. 2035, actually, really, you need to cover three continents. And actually, in 2030, you will need twice the surface of Earth to be covered by photovoltaic panels in order to feed all the energy required only for communicating this data flowing around. So the good news is that actually we have not stopped working on energy efficiency. So there is a, an approximative factor of 100 of gain in terms of energy efficiency, that actually will mean we will only need something around the full surface of France covered by photovoltaic panels. That's still a number. Anyway, it's a lot. So uh, if you take an example of the digital twins, have you heard about t digital twins? Yeah, you're familiar with. OK, the idea is that one of the ideas we have in, in the new service uh, starting from the material 5G to after, that you can have a replica or system working in a digital space. For example, you can have your house with all those connected things dealing with the management of the energy, the cooling, uh, the computer, the security, whatever, and then you can have this replica in a digital way, the manager and optimized way is working. You can also have a digital clean other person being operated, so the sure, the, the, the doctor working on operation by remote can have a kind of digital representation they can get familiar with, it can be for maintenance of, uh, of infrastructure and so on. So uh, I take an example here where we have a digital twin, and I'm saying an average digital twin of a, of, a, of a domestic place. We have a house, or I guess by memory, it's 200 square meters, so it's quite a big house, placed in the south of France. And then I will tell you why it's part of this in the south of France. And actually, then I compute uh, roughly what, where, where you are spending the, the energy here and there. And then you can see most of the expenses here is at the end of, for the AI support and training. And actually, if you account for all these elements of, uh, of expenditure, and actually you can see to use one hour and a half a day, the digital trends actually is also kind of conservative, and you can see to use the today technology of photovoltaic panel at the in the, in the south of France, with the amount of our sun, we have daylight, which is quite important in France, that actually you will need something around 250 square meters of panel installation in your house. 
If you consider normally, if they're happy when you have 20 to 25, that means actually there's uh, another magnitude of problem. So again, why all this, uh, all this, uh, all this um, energy is spent around is because the, we have a lot of data has been generated, transmit, uh, process, and stored. And actually, the question I have is for us is actually, do we have a way to reduce this amount of energy? So we have to rethink the data generation to use chain. And uh, so this, uh, the question is, is it essential to have all this uh, data flowing around the network uh, starting from the generation? Are all these uh, bits we share in the network of same importance, can some of them can be less pr protected Neglected, actually, for good, uh, and uh, can we move somehow from what we have today in the communication modes in the computing system for, from a bit reality? That means actually we want to have every uh, bit real, uh, reliability. We want to have every bit precisely receive the code understood to a semantic fidelity and accept the concept, either if it's blur. You, I mean, if you think in your daily life. Most of the time, either now I'm talking, you might not understand 100% of what I'm saying. I might also not 100% sure of what I'm saying, but at the end, the concept is, is flowing from here to there because actually you go for the semantic. That's something that we should be applied also to machines. So what we have here that as today, we have the two or more communicating system. We have what we can call an observer, which is the transmitter, which is getting access to the data, okay? And actually, is sending this data to a, a receiver, we can call learner, that actually this learner is uh, performing, for example, inference in the data and, and doing some understanding to do some decision. The approach of today, uh, the, the transmitter and the receiver, they know each other. So either they've been you know, exchanging in the house for about 10 years, they start almost from zero from the point of view or the way they shape the communication. So we have been always taking care of the thing that, that the bits from one part to another should be perfectly received, they actually, the hardware design should be as much as efficient, efficient as possible in order to, for example, support very high capacity networks so where you go for spectrum like subterra terras millimeter waves, so you go for very challenging contexts, while we're never taking into account much how we can not only compress the data, but really avoid to get this data. So, uh, of course, if I say that there's an alternative approach, a few years ago, more than 70 years ago, uh, another visionary guy uh, named Cloud Shannon, who knows Shannon? That's good, the good statistics. Then I have a quiz for you about Shannon. Okay, so, okay, good to you know. So, actually, uh, uh, a weather, Shannon weather states something that was very interesting. They divide the communication system on three layers layer A, the fundamental one, actually is the one taking care of the technical problem. So how, how accurate has to be the communication for, uh, for transmitting bits from one part to another of the network. Then there's another layer, up layer, level B, which actually is uh, dealing with the semantic problem. So how precisely do the transmitter symbol convey the desired meaning? So the, the transmitter is somehow inducing some understanding to receive it. How this message sent helps understand it. And then the third level, the level C, is about the effectiveness problem, where actually how this bit have been transmitted correctly, have been understood correctly, help in doing something useful. Because I mean, I can send you a lot of information, you can understand all this information, but then it's useless for what you do. At that time, let's see. <laughs> Just not the magic. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Okay, so both are useful. So actually, at that time, Shannon said, you know, I want to concentrate, we have to concentrate on level A. Mainly because, first of all, level A doesn't exi didn't exist well at the time. And I mean, first of all, you have to find a way to send information once or another. And the other reason, because actually, the only way to mathematically formalize the different level was somehow available for level A, where actually used statistics. It was the years where the statistics were very important. And then, years after, in 2010, some researchers start slightly work about this thing. And actually, less than two years ago, we heavily started working on the semantic communication level B and level C. So just graphically, I don't want to go too many details. So you can see you have this level A, where you do all the, I mean, all the hardware you're doing is around here, okay? 
all around here. This is more what uh, someone can call, for example, uh, the software part, where you have all this uh, algorithm. We actually, what we do with that, we have the data, and we, don't, we do what we call the semantic structure. That means you take some structure, some meaningful uh, relation between the different concepts you can grasp from the data, and then from that you form messages, then then you translate in a common on a common communication channel is receive you decode that and then you try to extract uh, information again for interpreting what it is saying and then you use that for updating something. So in this case, what we change in the communication system is that you have an observation from the real world of the outside world, and then you want to have informed decision. So you want to decide something about an understanding. So what you do before sending bits, you understand and then you transmit. You don't do some kind of blind communication as we, as we did before. So the teacher, he, he actually he have this observation and then translate that in kind of meaningful concepts. For example, you have uh, the text and there's a cat, there's another carrot and there is a meal. And then you have, those are concepts that you're trying to see the correlation between these concepts. This is what you're doing. And then actually sending some kind of a concise representation of this concept and the learner Try to understand what the, what, the, what the teacher is saying and try to indeed grasp some inf informed decision to, to understand what to do with. So you have signal the current information on the physical world, but you have concepts that describe the concrete uh, objects of, of the observation. And then you also, have, that's very important where we're going to insist, you have the language to describe this uh, the signal. So I guess most of you I always think that artificial intelligence is from about implementing the hardware, finding the algorithm, but I do consider the two attribute and algorithm might not use the same logic. So if they have to interact together, it's crazy. Okay, you, I mean, uh, this is a French example. I put a rabbit in front of your door. Do you understand what does it mean? Je t'ai posé un lapin. Yeah, and for a French person, it means I didn't show up. For a not French person, it might be as cool as something for dinner. It's a good present. So, so you might have a precise communication, a suggestion concept, but then you don't understand nothing. So one important thing when you work about AI, you also understand if the training, the model, the logic beyond are compatible. Otherwise, you might have a perfect piece of AI and a perfect piece of AI, but then when cooperate together, I'd say it's a nightmare. Can you read that? You don't have to be precise. You have a semantic part in your, in your brain will actually help you to read in the words and actually as far as the first and last letter are the correct one and the length of the words the correct one, you're able to, to regenerate in your head the good word. So it's actually what we do with semantic communication, what we extract and learn the knowledge we need to, to share and actually, we are, can do the, indeed some kind of logical decision based on the language we use. We have two parts of the brain. So that's actually translated really in the AI. Uh, what we call the system one, where actually you do the fast reactive thinking. We actually have a mold that has been trained already. And actually, you don't do too much processing. You, you, you just decide. And those are the base of the major machine learning, uh, uh, feeder learning, uh, reinforcement learning, deep learning, etc. algorithm. But those are actually based mainly on the training on the data. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this, uh, this picture before. So if you, you know the story. So you, you have, uh, during the Second War, there was uh, the airplane there after some, uh, you know, action on the field. We were coming back, they got some bullets on the, on, the, on, the, on the wings and so on. And mathematicians want to understand how to reinforce the airplane in order to, to announce the, the chance that the plane was coming back. The good statisticians, uh, people that are working in statistics, actually they see, they, they said actually, you know, you have all these bullet parts here, bullets here, is where actually the, the airplane has been shooting. So actually, we need to enforce here so that if someone fired to me, then I can be more resistant. Interesting. But actually, the pilot said, you know, but you are counting on the wrong data. It's actually you are only observation of people that came back. But who did not come back? Well, all the airplanes were actually used through the, uh, the engines, or you through the, the pilot and so on. So it's very important when you deal with data to understand how good is your problem 
So how much you can compress the structure and, and, and the side actually, it is not good. So in the system one, it's really, I would say, um, dangerous with the system one if you don't really have a kind of pre-treatment about the data or what is working. But actually, there's also a system two, which actually is lower. It actually uh, does some kind of what we can call analytical thinking. And actually, is, is done for do some logical reasoning, for problem solving, actually for adapt to situations that were not there before. This is something that's a, it's a, it's an open challenge today. And actually, something that through the communication, you can train. That means actually, if you share data in a way where the communication is an act of continuous training, in that way, you can update, update the model even after the training. I like also the sentence uh, that put that there's no sense in being precise when you even don't know what you're talking about. Again, if you try to transmit bits from one side to another in a very precise way, but it doesn't fit with, with the way you are indeed processing your AI uh, is sense of not some kind of errors actually is useless. So, so it's important to consider the case where actually you are combining and making collaborative models well, where actually there's a mismatch in this kind of logic, training, and models. So I don't know if you also had this, uh, this example. And uh, years ago, more than 25 years ago, if I'm not wrong, there was uh, this mission to Mars with fail with a big F. We actually, there was a, the calculation were made in, in, uh, in Europe about the trajectory for landing and the, the actuators were conceiving US. So the next part uh, was the opposite, sorry. So the, 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 the calculation about the trajectory was missing in the US and the actuator were conceived in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, actually. So the, there was actually the, the units of, of the, uh, the, uh, the calculation was not compatible. And then, so the, the probe land in a very bad way on Mars and they, and they burned more than 125 million dollars. So according to, to that, uh, the question is what really, how can we somehow have this kind of, of a match between two different oh, speaking artificial intelligence and, and the data we shape? So I want to give another example here. I don't know if you know this Aboriginal uh, population in Australia, we actually don't have left and right. They say north, south, east, and west. For example, they say, be careful, there's a, a banana on the south, southwest of your leg. Okay, so uh, so everyone there is in the cardinal direction. So you say hello, you say in which way you go. If you say, uh, so you can answer, for example, I'm going north, northwest, uh, uh, far away. Uh, so you can really not follow, you can pass the hello phase if you don't know where the north is. So now if you close your eyes, close it like two seconds, please close the eyes, and point with your arm where, where is the north, for example. Okay, keep, keep the arm in that direction. All of you, I have a few of them will do. Okay, now keep the arm like this and look and look uh, to the others. If you take a guy of five years old, would be perfectly know from this community, will know perfectly. You are completely around, around the spot. So what I'm saying is actually the logic you have is condition your training you have in your, uh, in your, uh, in your machine learning AI. So different language train and different kinds of human capability. So that's the same thing that we have also for AI. So now take the example of Shannon. So this is Shannon different moment to life. Then I will ask you to, to order this, uh, to order this in time. If you are an English speaker, you will most probably order from left to right. It's the same way you write. If you are from Arabic culture, you will probably order from right to left, okay? So if, uh, if, if you do not consider the, this mismatch of a language, you can really have a huge problem in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the combination of the two logics. So then if you look for, for how uh, one of these original guys will do that, it's very funny. If they're sitting standing and facing the south, they will uh, the order from left to right. So, uh, sitting and facing the north, from right to left. If sitting uh, facing the east, the time comes toward the body and so on and so on. So the language has a real impact and change the way we reason, reason in, in this structure. Uh, so, so just to summarize this, the language shape, the way you think, uh, so the communication itself should be shaped uh, to see how 
the, the, the artificial intelligence is trained and how uh, reasons. And actually, you might have se severe what we call semantic ambiguity in a way that I tell you a concept, but for me it's perfectly clear. I see a cat, you understand cat, but doesn't mean the same thing for you. So it's kind of thing we have to, to, to avoid. There's another example also like uh, for this, uh, you heard about this attention mechanism in AI, for example. No, so if you, so this is a case where there's a, there's a selling of a vase and actually say, uh, the sell, uh, the, the vase is sell for one million, two million, three million. In a Germanic language, you would say, he broke the vase. So where you put your attention is actually on who did that, not why it happened. On the contrary, in the Romance language, like Spanish, for example, French, Italian, and so on, you would say the vase was broken. So you remember the intention rather than who did it. So to conclude, because uh, I guess uh, time is running over, uh, the key part here is that when you conceive uh, a system of AI which is cooperating together, you're not only concerned about how efficient you are in your embedded part, but you also need to consider how efficient is the communication and how the communication itself can be a training act in the way that the two uh, or more agents work together, learn to work together. What we call in, a, in our system, we say that, that there's a large the language that emerge between the different uh, users. So it actually that they learn how to communicate in a way that the cat means something else to the other and you start changing the words, I mean, the, the words, the concept you share together. So this is uh, something that can be really a bottleneck in the use of AI. Okay, so I guess uh, I finish. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to answer. Thank you. So this is just a couple of periods. We have some more details of the we'll okay. say in two minutes. Thank you very much. Do we have some questions for you? Okay, so let's thank again. Speakers come from France to Toulouse, and we've talked about the nano meters, etc. And more especially about vertical technology. Okay, sit down. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction. So, yes, I'm Sylvain Peloquin, I'm a research engineer in the last CNRS in Toulouse, uh, particularly in the MPN, stands for Material Process and uh, Nano Devices uh, team. There's a. Uh, Sorry, we still have the old slide. What? <laughs> we still see the old slide. You need to share your slide. The slides are not wrong. So, our case is different for APH. 
Please, before the beginning, can for for remote people, can you say yes? What are you seeing on the screen? It currently is still black, and uh, but uh, it says that screen sharing has started. The, the screen share will start for, for you. But we don't see anything yet. It's still a black screen. Yeah, it's, it's, it's loading. It should work in a few minutes or moments, I guess. <laughs> I hope more seconds and minutes. <laughs> It's still loading for for our site. But that's strange. Normally it doesn't take that long to share. For sure. Share the screen. <laughs> I, I would simply try to unshare and share it again because maybe something got stuck. That happens sometimes. En fait, le zoom fait que cracher, fait que de cracher le, le programme. We, we try another time. Zoom is uh, crashing from fourth. Okay. Oh, Same result. A black screen, but it, it just says that you have started screen sharing, but nothing happens. So what we can propose, we'll try to fix this. If it's not fixed in a few minutes, let's say five minutes, you can uh, actually go to the live stream and you will have the diffusion of the whole intervention, same as here. Okay. And I send, I send the link on the discussion. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Pour la duplication. <coughs> Sur le bureau, il faut le dire.
happens. So did you also try to share the whole desktop instead of just sharing PowerPoint that sometimes helps? I don't have the. Yes. 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 Ça marche, François. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a sur l'écran du Zoom participant L'accès. Ouais, il faut dire. Il faut dire. De basculer sur le chat. Tu peux remettre le lien, Alexis We invite you to join the stream, the YouTube live stream, for the moment. Please. So uh, thank you. So uh, as I was saying, I'm Sylvain Peloquin. I'm a research engineer in the in the last uh, CNRS in Toulouse, in the NPN team, and especially on an activity on nanoelectronics uh, activity under the, the lead of uh, Guillaume Larieu. Uh, and so today we we'll try to introduce you on the opposite of uh, what is uh, Emilio, which uh, we which was macro. I'm more like in the micro, even in the nano. Uh, systems. So I will try to introduce you to the nanowire-based transistor for nanoelectronics. Uh, so, to, to, so. Yeah. no, no. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, oh. okay. Ah, c'est le détachement d'un coup. C'est pas le Je crois que c'est le coup. On va le Ok. Simplement. Et on va juste. So, a uh, bit of context, of course, uh, in our world, we have a lot of uh, Connection, cloud computing, AA, which is the subject uh, today, and everything that uh, that we have in our today uh, today life report is um, based on a real simple device, uh, which is a MOSFET. So it's, it's used for CMOS, for logic, for everything. And this is just a simple thing. It's a switch. Uh, basically, we have a tension between the source and the drain. And this, uh, the, the flow of current is controlled by the, the gate. Uh, MOSFET stands for metal organic, uh, the metal oxide 
si, si les semi-conducteurs uh, feed l'effect transistor, so the metal is here, the oxide is here, the semi-conductor is uh, here, and the, there's a field effect that controls the, the, these transistors. And so, of course, this device uh, dates from decades ago, and uh, there has been a lot of evolution of this device. Uh, I guess a lot of uh, you know this, uh, this type of curves. It's called the, the Moore's Law. It's a law in quotes because this is not uh, a physical law. It's an empirical uh, trend that has been noticed first by Mr. Moore uh, that said, OK, ah, it seems that the transistor per chip uh, seems to double every two years. And so let's, let's call it a law. It became also a um, uh, self-predictive uh, trend because the constructors are not saying, OK, so now we have to, to go to this number of transistors and transistors. And the, for, to do this, you have to reduce the size of your, your devices, of your transistors, and basically by re reducing the size. But there's a limit uh, that you can apply to the reduction of size. And the, in the history of the microelectronics, we, we faced this kind of limitation on a number of time. And we are again, uh, uh, there's again happening a new uh, limits that has to be overcome. So uh, I won't, I will be fast on this because uh, Christelle already uh, explained the full Monty project. So there's a six partner in it. Uh, we are trying to, to make a device of uh, translation in here, translation, so computation, uh, every part of the logic inside the, the device and not sending uh, the, the, the information to a cloud computing that will be sent back to the helet. Uh, so it's, you need to be really energy efficient and you need to be uh, as close as possible uh, to uh, how a neuron is working. And the aim is to build this uh, elementary brick, the N2C2 neural, net, neural network uh, compute cube that we could uh, assemble uh, on the surface and even uh, possibly stack to have a very powerful uh, neural native neural system. Uh, so um, I'm uh, yeah. So I'm working uh, mostly on this uh, part of the project, which, which is the fabrication of the most simple devices, which are the MOSFET, and then we will try to go to more logic to CMOS to, uh, to complexify. But uh, first, we rely on uh, the, the 3D nanowires uh, vertical transport uh, FET that I will explain to uh, you today. So uh, basically, for the, in the MOS uh, technology, the, 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 device, the device scaling means you have to reduce the dimension. And if we take only the, the, the length of the, the grid, uh, the, the gate, you will have, you will face a problem is that the, the source and the drain are too close. And what happens is that here you have a very good transistor behavior, where we, you have a, a current for the off state, a current for the on state, and so you can switch. But when you reduce the, the size of the grid, you will arrive to the point where you can differentiate the ion and the I off state, and also you will, uh, you will have an eye off that is really high. So that means that you are consuming energy for nothing. So this is the, the, what is uh, at stake for this uh, technology. And uh, what has been made through the history of microtechnology is that from this planar FET, where we had uh, one gate that is controlling the, the channel uh, here, uh, the thing is that you have the, the influence of all the bulk of the silicon that is a problem. So what has been uh, proposed, uh, especially you heard from, from uh, IBM, is the triple gate uh, fin fet, fin like uh, the fin of a shark. And so the idea is that you start to isolate the, the SI channel from the, from the bulk, uh, and you have a triple gate because you are controlling from three sides of the channel. The next step, of course, is to isolate completely the, the system. And so there's a horizontal transport, uh, horizontal transport FET that are proposed either with nanowires or with nano sheets. Uh, and we could ask why just put a big bunch of silicon 
the idea is that you need to also have a small section that can be electrically controlled on your nanowire. And so if you want to have more current in your transistor, you add more nanowires, which can lead also to other challenges. Uh, and of course, the ultimate uh, version of this is the vertical transport gator around. Uh, GAA is for gator around. Um, and so that means that not, not only are you separated from the bulk and you are isolated from all this problem, but also you, uh, you leverage one other challenge is that when you are trying to make the device smaller and smaller, the, the gate length is really difficult to etch. And here you are changing a problem of etching a gate to a problem of depositing a metal. And it's much easier to, to deposit really thin layers of metal than etching uh, precisely some layer of, layers of metal. So this is one of the most promising candidates for, for the ITRS, for the, the, the planning of the new devices. Uh, here I show you some example, of course it's not exhaustive, uh, of um, uh, devices that have been made uh, academically. Uh, here you have an example of uh, uh, an array of silicon nanowire. So you see this is horizontal transport. So you still have the problem of having a gate as thin uh, as possible. Uh, you can uh, stack them, so that's a really good point. So you can have more current delivered and you can eventually uh, control gates uh, independently. And uh, it can be even stacked uh, up to seven layers, uh, that, uh, the, um, that, which is a really impressive uh, uh, result. But still, you, uh, you get this trouble with the horizontal. Our approach uh, dates from uh, uh, one, one decade now, uh, uh, initiated uh, by, by Guillaume Laye, is uh, to, to, to do a vertical transport system, where here you have a source contact that uh, leads to a drain contact and a gate contact that controls the, 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 the channel in the middle. So you see here in the TEM image that we have a, two spacers separating the metallic gate uh, a metal gate uh, here, uh, metal, ga uh, metal, uh, metal drain here, metal source uh, here. Uh, the advantage uh, we'll talk about also is that the nanowire here is uh, symmetrical. You have PTSI on both uh, sides, and this is uh, really good, uh, really interesting for uh, access resistance, which is really important in this kind of de devices. Uh, so. Yes, uh, I, I just wanted to show a little slide about uh, how it can interest also foundries and constructors. Uh, the Samsung has announced a, a gate-around FET for the 3 nanometers node. Uh, we can see here, but it's a horizontal uh, transport uh, sheet system. Uh, STMC also has made the same, and uh, there's, there has been an announcement from IBM for vertical transport FET using nano sheet uh, system. That so that means that there's of course a lot of interest in it, and uh, there will be a lot of new development in the coming years. Uh, on the on the academic side, you can see that there's a lot of team that are working with different uh, kind of configuration, uh, geometry, material. There, there's um, uh, there's a lot of uh, different uh, performances that we, you can measure from, uh, from them. But uh, one of the main drawbacks that you often, uh, that often appear is the fact that you get asymmetrical contacts between the source and the drain. And the technology, you often have very good performance, but the technology is often complex and uh, not compatible with the, with the CMOS uh, technology systems. Uh, so on the, on the side of uh, our devices, as I said, okay, I, I already said it, so um, we are working on something that will be symmetrical. Uh, and um, I, I will go first on the, the part of the fabrication of the nanowire. So I don't know if everybody has knowledge about the technology part, but uh, basically to fabricate nanostructures and especially nanowires, there's two main approach. The first one is the top-down approach. So the idea is that you have a material that will be used as a mask 
for an, a step of etching. And so you will subtract material from a uh, wafer of silicone, for example. And the other way is the bottom up. So it's an additive system where you have something that will be a catalyst for the growth of a nanowire. Uh, and, and so uh, in the end, you have to get rid of these tips uh, eventually. Uh, so the standard issue that uh, can happen in this kind of uh, fabrication is the, the way you are able to localize your nanowire, if you are able to have a, a, a big range of density, if the density is uh, statistically the, the same, uh, um, if you can integrate, especially into a SI uh, compatible platform, uh, and so on. So uh, I'll show, show you here an example of the bottom-up uh, growth of nanowire. This is really the standard uh, way. There's a many, many ways, but this is the, the most simple uh, way to do it by a vapor liquid solid mechanism. So basically, you have a metallic cat catalyst. Often, this is a gold nanoparticles that are thermally treated to have the, the right diameter, the right size. Uh, and you put them in a, in a vapor containing silicone that will enrich the, the, the gold uh, system and that will start to grow the nanowire. And so the, the, the vapor liquid solid is that because the, the vapor, the silicone that is in the vapor will go into the gold nanoparticle that is in the liquid phase and it will uh, super saturate this particle and then uh, uh, precipitate as a solid and make layer by layer a nanowire, which diameter will, will be defined by the diameter of the, the particle. So you can see here a really good example of really high nanowires with really good uh, uh, diameter. Uh, you, you, what, what I can say that you, you have to be careful about so the contamination during the fabrication, the defect that can happen at the size of the, this uh, nanowire, but this is one way to do it. Uh, on our team, we are working on a, um, on a top-down approach. So uh, basically, we take our SI wafers and uh, we will uh, spin coat uh, negative resist, uh, uh, negative resist that is uh, electrosensitive. And then we will directly write with EBIM lithography the pattern that we want. Uh, so this is a system of direct writing that is uh, that is uh, start to be used uh, also in in the industry. And so you you do, you you draw the pattern, you reveal them, so you get a, a resist mask that can be used for a step of etching that will reveal your nanowires. And with this, you can do uh, arrays and arrays of uh, nanowires with really good uh, diameters. And here you have another example with a really high density and, uh, and uh, small uh, diameters. Uh, here, just to, to have an idea, the, the surface uh, is multiplied by five by the fact that the, the density and the height of the nanowires. Uh, so you have to take care, of course, the local location. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is really reproducible. It's a clean process that is compatible with the CMOS technology. Then the, the step after, uh, we, we use uh, wet oxidation for uh, three or four reasons. The, the first one is that we will use it, uh, we will oxidize the, the nanowires and that will permit to reduce the size. So even if we don't have the, the size that we wanted at the beginning, we can even reduce the, the size of the channel and that's really interesting to have really small uh, diameters. Uh, secondly, we can uh, you use it also because it allows to uh, create active areas and separate for, to isolate electrically other areas that we don't want to, to uh, contact. And it's also really useful to smoothen the size of the, the site of the nanowires. And another, another benefit is also uh, that the anisotropy, so the anisotropy defined by the difference of diameters at 100 nanometers uh, difference. Uh, you, you can see here that after the, the, the fabrication of the nanowire, the anisotropy here, here is in, at uh, 90%, which is uh, good, not, but not, uh, not perfect. 
And after the oxidation and the oxide stripping, we perfect the anisotropy to 99.5. I won't go into, into the detail a bit, but it's uh, due to the constraint uh, during the oxidation that happens to, to grow uh, more when the diameter is uh, bigger than when it's, it's thinner. So that, that's a way to straight the, the, the nanowires. Um, so once we get our nanowires, uh, we, we have uh, another really important step. It will be all the part with oxidation and silicidation. Because the nanowires here are not isolated. Uh, if we put a metal gate, it will be in direct contact with the silicium. So there will be a, an electrical contact. And so we first have another oxidation, a dry oxidation to have a very good uh, oxide, an electrical quality uh, oxide, uh, but it goes everywhere. And then we do a uh, netting really anisotropic that allows to uh, clean the tip and the bottom of the, 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 the nanowire arrays. And then we deposit platinum and treat it thermally. And this will allow to create PTSI heads on the heads of on the tip of each nanowire and also at the bottom. And so this way we have in one, one step the source and the drain that is prepared. Uh, then it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite simple. We have a spacer that it's a spin on glass. So this is um, basically this is silicon uh, dioxide uh, that is deposited and then etched to, uh, to get to the middle of the, these nanowires. And we grow, uh, uh, we, don't go, we deposit uh, metal, uh, which is chromium here, and we part, uh, what we put on it to create. So here you have the PTSI uh, area uh, that goes to, to the, the pads. Here you have the PTSI here, and here is the chromium part. So we have two, uh, two metallic uh, layers at 90 degrees uh, from each other. And then we repeat the, the spacer uh, part where we, we have it, and then we etched it until go to the tip of the nanowires. And so the, the device is almost ready now. And uh, there's only the microelectronic, uh, the, the microstructuration of all this. That means that we will really need to have uh, three pads. Uh, one, uh, here we, we, we create a via. Uh, that goes to the bottom, to the, to the PTSI. We create another via here in the same, in the same step because the chromium is, uh, stops the etching. So in the same step, we create the two vias and we can uh, metallize uh, what interested us. So the, the bottom part, the gate that goes here and the top contact that goes on the tip of the nanowire. And this way you get your transistor. Uh, and so this is uh, some TEM uh, analysis of uh, the nanowires that have been uh, obtained. So you see uh, each nanowire, the, the green that has been colorized is the oxide part around the nanowire. Uh, the PTSI is at the bottom and the, and the, and the tip of the nanowire. And you have a, a metal gate that is really uh, around, uh, around them. Uh, so now I will talk a little bit about uh, how we characterize them and what we expect from them. Uh, and uh, so I just were showing some electrical characteristics so that everyone is on the same page. <clears throat> so uh, for a transistor, one of the most interesting thing is the IDVG transfer characteristic. So it shows the closing and the opening of the uh, of the channel. Uh, so you have the the, the the, the current drain current on one side, <coughs> and uh, the and the, the voltage uh, applied on the gate for dif different tension applied to the ground. Be careful. Uh, here you have it in a linear scale, and the three here are on the log logarithmic scale because we want to see things from different sides. So. On the left part, you have a uh, on state where, where the, you have the, the higher current, and on the right part, you get the, the, half, the half state. Uh, so um, one thing that we look is the, the high off, so the, the current so when the, the transistor is off, 
uh, we take the, the, the voltage threshold. Uh, that means that the, where the, the transistor will go from the on to the off uh, state. Starting from that, you can calculate the ion, so the value of current that will, uh, that when your transistor is on, with adding one volt uh, from there. Uh, we calculate also the sub uh, slope, that is the steepness of the, this, this curve. Uh, that means that uh, the, the more, uh, the, the lower the, the sub slope is, the better it is, because it's how many millivolts are needed to have one decade of current uh, more. And we calculate also the DIBL, the drain induced barrier lowering. So it means that due to the, uh, the drain voltage that is applied, uh, it can shift this characteristic. And so you can measure how much it is shift. And for example, here, it's not really a good transistor, clearly, because the DIBL is really, uh, is really big. Uh, and so you want it to be uh, as small as possible also. Uh, so here are some results that uh, that um, uh, been obtained by Guillaume Larieu uh, in the in the last uh, works, uh, just to show that uh, we can fabricate this kind of transistor into the P-type MOS or the N-type MOS. Uh, another level is to uh, to aggregate them and to have a real CMOS. But uh, here we see that the characteristics are really similar and could be used uh, for this. At the difference that you need more nanowires in the NMOS system uh, due to the mobility of the, the, the carrier uh, in the in the N type systems. Um, I show you the, the influence of the gate oxide also, that the gate oxide that is in between the metal gate and the, the silicon channel. Um, we see that by uh, reducing the, the this uh, thickness we increase the, the capacitance, and so we get better results. Uh, so we, especially for the substitutional slope, we almost divide it by, by two. Now uh, the, that we have it, we, we can check also the influence of the DIT curing. Uh, that means that you are, when you are growing a silicon SiO2 uh, onto a SI channel, you, uh, you often get some defects of vacancy, some whatever, that can be uh, cured uh, by a thermal treatment into forming gas. That's a mix of nitrogen and hydrogen. And you see here the effect of this treatment that gives a really a better uh, substitution slope. But for example, the DIBL is divided by most than, than 10. Uh, and finally, we can uh, check if all these parameters uh, how they are influenced by the diameter of the nanowire that are, that are um, uh, used. And we see that uh, in all the parameters, so DIBL and substitution slope, you want them to be the, as small as possible. And for the ion IOF, you want it to be as high as possible and the IOF as low as possible, of course. And for all this, we see that up to 40 nanometers, you can have a very good transistors. And that's uh, really good uh, news because that gives you a window of procedure that is quite large to, to fabricate your system. Uh, finally, this is um, some uh, work that have been uh, that show that with this kind of transistor, uh, especially due to the, the, the symmetrical uh, part of the source and the drain, we get really good results. Uh, that can that even uh, where in the ITRS recommend for the five nanometers uh, TN <coughs> that allowed us to 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 work uh, uh, efficiently, uh, and I wanted also to show you that there's a lot of uh, teams that are working uh, worldwide on the integration in 3D. So uh, how to put a lot of uh, FET uh, sensors, uh, CMOS. Uh, logic, etc., in uh, in a three D integration. Uh, so you, we are also in this kind of curse, but of uh, of race. But uh, one of the really good, interesting thing is that we start from something that is already vertical. So we are we are an advantage for this three D integration. And to go back to the full Monty uh, project, the the uh, the the idea here. 
uh, would be to take advantage of this uh, vertical transport system to to um, uh, perhaps integrate multi gates that uh, that's allowed to have new system new circuitry so that's a new uh, new part that can be added here that can be uh, tested and again that will perhaps allow you to uh, to leverage the n2c2 uh, system and uh, also the i didn't talk about uh, especially about that but the, the there's a ferro ferroelectric uh, in the in the title and the idea is also to integrate ferroelectric and perhaps to start to really have something that looks like uh, a neuron in the sense that you can uh, send a signal that will be kept in memory and that will uh, be used to transfer a signal up to a certain threshold. So, so we are starting really to be uh, uh, neuron, uh, neuron like. And so as a conclusion um, uh, for this race uh, in AI, I, th I advise you to keep an eye on this kind of uh, of technology, uh, there's uh, there's a lot of industry compatibility and there's a lot of interest from the founders. So, so I think that that's something that will be the interesting to follow. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, I hope that you you enjoy the show. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you have any question, thank you, Sylvain. about so deep interest into the technology that time? Yes. yes. Uh, actually, for, for the size of the transistor and the get around, what are the three of three in terms of the different sizes of the transistor? Because in the bulk time, you have the value and the value of the area, the little number of the table around the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yes, we are. It's really a change of paradigm because the, the, here the, the the gate length is defined by the, the, the thickness of deposition. Okay. So basically, you can deposit as thin as you want, uh, and it depends also on the techniques and how you can control the thickness of the deposition. But that, that's really leveraging one of problem. You you can have other problem like how high you have you have to have a trade off or why the nanowires needs to be uh, uh, because uh, you can have a uh, problem of uh, having the, the of losing some some current if it's too short you can have also some some short channel effects so yeah but it's really uh, game changing the the, the, the system and uh, for the power consumption stuff you said at the beginning that it's kind of uh, yeah, basically because this kind of system have a much lower eye off okay. uh, uh, on, the, on the, the system itself is is made so as it's uh, really uh, isolated when it's isolated. The channel are really uh, off when they are off. Okay. Yes, please. Yes, perhaps I wasn't clear enough. So yes, we use arrays of nanowires because you can use one nanowire, and but the thing is that you will get a very small uh, ion that can be useful for some application. But the idea here is that the, the system is also scalable because if you want this amount of current, you can say, okay, I just have to put this amount of nanowires in, in the same place. So yes, they, are, they work in parallel. Um, so from your explanation, could you use more detail about the like the I'm sorry, sorry. So you said you can use a lot of uh, um, yeah, yeah, and and yes, it depends on what we we want for the for the current, uh, basically. And there's also a trade-off between the diameter of the nanowires. Uh, if you have bigger nanowires, you will have more current flowing, but you have you will lose in electro electrostatic control. So you have to think about it. 
If you put too many nanowires, you will start to have a lot of space used. So you lose the advantage of the area reduction. So plus parasitics in between. Plus parasitics in between. Yeah. Sorry, I spilled a little bit Okay, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, here, it's not the case. We, we, we directly uh, uh, polarize here because here, this is a plat uh, PTSI, so it's really metallic. And so, yeah, we have, uh, and we are, we are working on um, highly topped silicon also. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea how thick can be your space area? How thick? So, how thick mountain like to preserve this connection from the rain today, for example? Mm. Yeah, do you have any idea what is I think that is just from uh, I, I don't have an answer from a theoretical point of view or for what can uh, ultimately can be done. Uh, I'm for me I'm limiting to seven it's around 70, 80 nanometers. Uh, to, to be uh, quiet, but uh, perhaps we can go to Sina. It's a difficulty to control after, if you, yeah. yeah. Other questions? No, so let's thanks again, Silva. Okay, it's you, Thomas. Next one. Are you there, Thomas? Ah, uh, yes. I'm here. Oh, perfect. Okay. Right, right here. I think you can do it. I'm not sure. Uh, it is deactivated, so uh, Axel needs to allow yeah. free sharing. And uh, as he's the host, so he has to allow free sharing that yeah. I could share. I'm trying to come. Uh, I've got you, and uh, you're the host now. Okay. Okay, that, that also works. Okay, so Thomas Mikolovic. Is working uh, with NAMLAB um, in Dresden, but also as professor in Dresden University, TU, De TU Dresden. Uh, so I think, yes, so we, we have your slides in front of us. So Thomas, we talked about emerging semiconductor memories for in memory computing and neuromorphic computing. So somehow it's the, the, the following of what we have just heard before. Thomas, are you ready? Of course. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sorry that I could not come live, but my traveling schedule is so dense these mm. days that uh, it, it, it would not work out. Uh, but I hope uh, I can still bring a few messages across. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure it will be nice. And in case the uh, sound quality should be bad, then tell, to tell me I will turn on off the video then because uh, my internet here is okay, but not too fast. Okay. For the, for the moment, for the moment, it's quite good. Okay, thanks. So let's get started. I will start with a short introduction. Mm -hmm. I will go through emerging memory concepts and then we'll explain how you can make in-memory computing with those concepts 
And finally, I will show how you can make uh, out of those concepts primitives for neuromorphic computing. So, if you look, if, if you go into any uh, uh, at any device conference these days, a similar slide like this one you will find in the introduction of many many uh, talks. So, one problem that we are currently facing in electronic systems is the so-called von Neumann bottleneck. It means because the CPU and the memory are standard. Let's assume we want to calculate 2 plus 2. So we have to get the 2 out of the memory into the CPU. The second 2 out of the memory into the CPU. Now we do the calculation that we actually want. Plus two is four, and now we have to transfer the four again to the memory. As I said, it's oversimplified, but what I explained to you, it took four steps for actually only the one that I was interested in. Now you could think of two uh, extreme ways of solving that. Either you take a memory array and try to somehow do the logic operations in the array. This is what most people are doing today. Or you can do the other extreme, you can try to implement um, memory functions into logic cells and uh, then you have uh, in already available the data when you do the logic operation. Now you can go one step further and look at what your human brain is doing, because the, the human brain is doing it very energy efficiently and we don't understand too much about it, but we see Three major elements, we see neurons, we see synapses, the connection, neurons are the ones that fire the pulses, and we see axons which are transferring the signal. Yeah, so we could think about how can we realize what we see in the brain, which is a highly complex and a highly connected network of such neurons via synapses. And uh, the very simplest version of that would be an artificial neural network. And many people are talking about deep learning today. We hear a lot about that. And often it's simply realized uh, today still in software. I will talk about later how we can do that in hardware. Uh, and the idea is simple. Let's use this highly complex and highly uh, connected structure of the human brain and just have this neuron function uh, replaced by an activation function, could be a, a threshold function in the simplest case, and have some way uh, adapted to the uh, connections and sum up all these uh, uh, weighted functions that come from one node to the other one when it goes into this uh, uh, simple form of neuron. If we look at such a network, if we want to evaluate it, or if we want to find out what are the best ways to have here to solve our problem, in both cases we need lots of vector matrix modification. And I will also come back to that in just a minute. But we can go one step further in mimicking what we see in the brain, because uh, in the brain we're not having signals applied continuously, it's much more complex. We actually, uh, as I have mentioned, we actually work with spikes, which means we also have some sparsity in time, which makes it much more energy efficient. And this we can model in a so-called spiking neural network. There we really try to uh, realize what we know, how a neuron works. We don't know too much, but the few things that we know and the way uh, a synapse works. And uh, just to, 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 to mention that, the synapse more or less reacts to the difference of the pulses that are coming from both sides. And uh, um, if they are uh, positive in difference, then it uh, uh, strengthens the connection. If they are negative in difference, then it uh, makes it weaker. And the closer they are, the stronger the effect will be. Yeah, this is called spike time dependent plasticity. This is one of the simplest learning rules. And we will talk again about that later on. And the neuron I've already mentioned has to generate the spike based on the input signal. Yeah, now if, if we now look into memory, then there's uh, uh, the question, 
what are the different requirements that we need for memory cells or uh, for um, uh, um, a primitive of this, uh, 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 especially neural network, but also some other of these uh, in-memory computing concepts. And this is symbolized in this graph. So in a classical digital memory, you don't want to have the system react to anything that is below a certain threshold, because otherwise you will get uh, uh, disturbed. And you want to have it perfectly react after that threshold. So you want to have a high nonlinearity in the um, in the programming characteristics and in the erasing characteristics. On the contrary, if we want to have such uh, neural networks, we want to have many many states that we can uh, uh, that we can store, and we want to have a highly linear um, relationship. So that means we can take the memory cell as a starting point, but the optimization will look a bit differently. Now let's start with the emerging memories. I will only show one slide on every concept. If we look at what today is the mainstream in emerging uh, memories, we will see there are ferroelectric memories, magnetoresistive phase change, and then uh, uh, a few other ones that are combined under the term of RAM, resistive random access memory. Um, uh, it is Phase change memories and magnetic resistive memories would not have been around when this term was created, then probably these two would also fall into this category because they all have in common that you actually read a resistance state for uh, uh, the information to, to find out what information is uh, stored. By the way, just as a side remark, they are all called somehow random but they don't fulfill the, um, the requirements that you need for real random access memory. There is a, a sort of confusion in the community. In that sense here, RAM is simply meant as a synonym for semiconductor memory. Now, ferroelectric memory is the only one that still uses reading of charge, which also tra tra traditional uh, memories do, but they do it with a special trick. Now, let's look into all of these. Uh, just with one slide. So ferroelectric is a material where you have two stable polarization states. And you can look at this as if some uh, ions in the lattice of the material can switch between two stable positions, but they cannot stay in the middle. So they can only be either up or down. And that leads to such a mystery, this curve. And naturally, this could be your zero and this could be your one. So you can very well use that for storing information. And there are two things that are very special about ferroelectric. Uh, the one thing is this transition is field driven, as you see here. The only charge that is flowing is actually the charge that is transferred by shifting these ions. So there's no uh, inefficiency during programming. Keep that in mind when we look at the other one. And the second speciality is there are three different ways to read it out. You can directly read the charge that is transferred during switching. This would be done in a cell which is uh, looking very similar to a DRAM cell, one D, one C cell, with some small differences compared to DRAM. Then you can put it into the gate stack of a transistor, leading to a so called ferroelectric field effect transistor. Then it would be a flashlight uh, device. Or you could put it between two electrodes, make it very thin, and then that ends up in a ferroelectric tunneling junction or FPJ in short. And this is an RM like device because now you are measuring the resistance uh, change. Now, if we look at magnetoresistive devices, there we have in principle two ferromagnetic electrodes and a dielectric in between. Uh, the, the real stacks are much more complex. Uh, but now, whether the uh, magnetization is parallel to each other or anti-parallel, it will be a lower or a higher resistance. And this is based on the fact that if you tunnel through such a thin tunneling barrier, you also have to find uh, um, unoccupied states with the right spin or orientation on the other side. And if the uh, polarization is in the opposite direction, then this situation is simply not matched 
and the current will be not much lower. For writing, we will use we are using the so-called Bing-Talk transfer effect. So that means we uh, 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 put a current through the device and we transfer the spin from the one side to the other one, and by this we shift it. This, of course, is not as efficient as ferroelectric switching because now only part of the current is active in uh, switching. As already mentioned, these stacks in practice are 20 layers of uh, uh, materials because there's a lot of uh, tricks behind how you make this magnetization stable, how you close the field line, how you make this reference stable, and so on. So typically you have about 20 layers, and these are these have to be controlled on the Angstrom level, which is quite challenging. Nevertheless, it, re, it, it revised uh, uh, the interest by this spin talk transfer, and we see many foundries are now offering devices based on this concept. The next one is phase change memory. In this one, you change the phase between amorphous and uh, crystalline in a so-called calcogenized material. <coughs> These materials have uh, not a lot of uh, lack exchange between crystalline and amorphous, but a high resistance chain and a high reflectivity chain change, why they are also used in rewritable optical memories. And now uh, by heating up, you can either melt them and then you end up in the uh, amorphous phase if you squeeze, if you quench the device or speed it up and wait till it crystallizes and then you're in the crystal phase. Uh, so these devices are well established because the rewritable CDs, DVDs, Blu ray discs, they all rely on that concept. The thermal management is crucial, and this is something that you're not used to in semiconductor devices. And uh, uh, one thing, for a reaching like 600 centigrade, which is about the typical melting temperature, you need quite high current. So that's why you need a bipolar selector device, which is one of the problems here. You might have heard Intel and Micron had this 3D cross point technology out uh, based on this uh, material concept. Uh, it was taken off the market now again, not because it didn't work technically, but because it was economically not uh, successful. ST Microelectronics, in contract, is pushing this technology for uh, embedded uh, applications. And I just saw a very nice demo a few days ago at VLSI technology from ST showing a product for automotive applications. And finally, the RM devices. I already said there are at least four different physical mechanisms and the more important ones of these are either based on the movement of uh, oxygen vacancies, which at the end lead to a redox reaction in a metal oxide and then change the valence state of the metal in the metal oxide and therefore change the conductivity or by the movement of, um, of uh, metal ions in a solid state electrolyte. The first ones are called normally balance change or anion migration based RAM and the second one is often called CB RAM or uh, electrochemical uh, metallization. Just to give you an idea what we can do with these resistive switching effects, this is some from our own work where we work with niobium oxide and there the, the beauty is uh, you can change the niobium oxide and the interfaces to the electrodes a little bit and you can tailor the switching characteristics. This is the typical, uh, I would say, digital switching characteristics, as you can see here. Below this value here, not a lot changes, uh, but once you get into switching, the switching is abrupt. In the reset, it's a little more analog, so people that want to use these devices typically try to use the reset or tuning the and on the other extreme, this is something we are currently uh, working on in a, a German uh, project, which where of course. Uh, you will always have a thing 
increment uh, disturbed even then. So you cannot get uh, a recomputing. So if you if you look at resistive switching, yeah, it's a simple way computing. You can simply look at the input signal, not as uh, putting a signal to a wire, but putting a pulse to your device. Yeah? And now putting a, a programming pulse on the one side or on the other side of the device is your input signal. And whatever is in the device at a certain number of uh, deprogramming operations is your output. And with this, we have shown a few years ago that you can realize all 16 basic logic functions if you have the appropriate resistive switch. So the idea is really think differently about your uh, uh, the way how you realize your your uh, um, uh, signals. Now, uh, of course, this one resistive switch is not a logic gate. You need a quite an overhead around it. That's why you want to do this in large array. If you go to the transistor-based things like the feedback, then uh, of course, if you put such a feedback into a memory array, because you have uh, two different uh, um, uh, states in there, you always get a different output signal compared uh, 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 between the two signals. And you can use that to realize a logic function, or you can simply place your feedback, and that's one of the beauties of feedback. You can place it into a typical logic gate, and then uh, change the input behavior of this set. Now, in, in a little more detail, just consider you're using your feedback with a pull-up device, something you're probably familiar with, looks like an inverter, a pull-up device in the simplest case can just be a resistor or can be another transistor. Then you will get, based on whether your uh, feedback is programmed in the one or the other uh, direction, either the right blue curve or the left one. And now if your input is either zero or one, you will get uh, 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 three times a brief on a high signal and one time a zero signal. Depending on how you interpret the zero and the one, this will be an, an, an AND or an AND gate, and you will get the reciprocal if you add this pull up device. And moreover, if you add just a, a source a voltage here, you can shift this characteristic. And then you can even switch it from NAND to NOR. And you can put the same basic concept into more complex uh, uh, gates. And you can also use SPSOI and uh, uh, don't uh, change the, uh, the curve completely by the source voltage, by a, by, by a back bias and SPSOI, and that makes it very convenient. Now, another way of doing in memory computing has become very, very popular because of neural networks. I mentioned already that you want to have plenty of um, plenty of uh, uh, vector matrix multiplication in these artificial neural networks. And this you can do in an analog way fashion in a very convenient way by simply taking such a cross point array of uh, memory cells. And uh, let's assume in the simplest case, the memory cell is just a resistor. Let's assume a resistive uh, switching memory, as I have just mentioned. Then, of course, this resistor will have an output uh, uh, current, which is uh, the voltage divided by its resistance or multiplied with its, with its conductance. And along one thick line, you will sum up all the currents that come out of the different resistors. And that means the output will be the sum of uh, uh, the voltage divided through the resistances, and this is exactly what you need. Uh, this is exactly the um, uh, multiply accumulate uh, operation that you need to do your vector matrix multiplication. And you can use uh, different devices to store your weight inside. So you can use a resistive switch. You can add a transistor because having so many resistive switches in the array, you also have to take care of what you can get rid of these effects if you add another select device. You can also use just one transistor. You could you can even use traditional flash cells and things like that. So this is very powerful. 
for using for, for doing this calculation in the analog world. Of course, the discussion that's ongoing is going back to analog. Does it make sense? What is the uh, what is the quality of the signal that we will get out? What is the overhead that we generate by transferring signals from both worlds? So you will find opponents in both directions in the community there. Now, this is just examples. I will skip that how this was done with PSAT devices because I'm, I'm already talking quite long and I want to go to the next step uh, and also want to share with you how can you do uh, uh, primitive devices that you need for neuromorphic uh, systems. And I, own, uh, I only call the, you also find different definitions in literature. Some people also call artificial neural networks neuromorphic. I reserve this term for the ones where we really try to mimic the primitives that we have in the brain, the neurons and the synapses, and sometimes even some other elements. But most people focus on mimicking the neurons and the, and the synapses. I have copied here a graph that I have stolen from my colleague Daniele Iolini from um, uh, Politecnico Milano. He wrote a very nice article uh, on this in APL materials on how you can use resistive switches for doing this job. And he has, has, has these elements here described. So you can use uh, uh, the set reset transition in RM and PCM devices for doing. Um, uh, synaptic plasticity with short term uh, 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 plasticity. You can use volatile resistive switching devices. I didn't go too deep, but one of the devices that I showed you from the niobium oxide uh, example is a bit of that one I didn't explain what the volatile devices. So there are some uh, other options as well, how to do volatile devices. For the uh, matrix vector multiplication, I have just shown you how you can do that. And the integrated fire, you can use pilot accumulation in RM and PCM devices. And I will show you another example in just a minute. And I have added what you would do in ferroelectrics. So you can use the PFET or FCJ with analog switching for the. Uh, 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 for the uh, a vector matrix multiplication, you can use Akumulu uh, a minute in scale PFET for doing the integrated fire neuron. You can use FPFET or FPJ with low polarization field for doing long term synaptic plasticity. And for short term synaptic uh, <coughs> plasticity, you can use the same devices but with large depolarization field. So uh, here you see an example of a resistive switching device. And this is very simple. So you have a, a quite analog switching characteristics here. Now, just use that device, apply different the pulses to one side and to the other side, and uh, see how the resistance changes with the difference of the two pulses. And you get something that looks very close to the spike time dependent plasticity curve. Now, if you want to use the resistive for a neuron, there are several options. But one that uh, we have also been working on is the so-called heuristor. There you use the so-called threshold switching, uh, resistive switching device. This is one that is volatile. So if you, if you switch it on, and you take away the voltage and it switches off again. This is important here, but uh, I don't want to go too much into details, but adding a few capacitances and resistances, you can actually mimic this uh, uh, spike this spike behavior as you know it from a neuron, but of course you still have a quite complex circuit. Um, now, with with the synapses, this is an example from a PFET-based synapse. Uh, in in PFET, of course, because I showed you, you have this this hysteresis, and it looks like you only have two uh, uh, two points. And, and uh, um, uh, polarization up, polarization down. This is correct, but any, every ferroelectric has uh, many, many domains, and the domains switch individually. And if we look at um, uh, a PFET, which has 
several domains, let's say in the in the range of tens or even hundreds domains, which which requires that you have a few hundred nanometers of device sizes, then you can get very easily also device time dependent plasticity. If the device becomes very small, we will discuss uh, 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 in a few seconds. But I just want to show you here. I didn't explain the tunnel junction too much yet, and uh, uh, there is, uh, I, I will just uh, describe here a variant of a tunnel junction. Here we combine the ferroelectric with the dielectric, and now depending on whether the uh, ferroelectric is polarized in the one or the other di direction, we will tunnel only through the dielectric barrier, or we have to modify for the non-time tunneling through the dielectric barrier and part of the ferroelectric. This, of course, changes the resistivity of the device. The classical tunnel junction uses a very thin ferroelectric, but in that case, if you use a polycrystalline device, a uh, material like the one we like to use for ferroelectric, we get a very high background current, and that's why we prefer this way of doing it. And with such a device, again, if it doesn't become too small, uh, we can do the same trick, applying pulses. Here you see the shape that we use for this, but you can use different shapes uh, for this pulse. And again, you get nice by time dependent plasticity. Uh, now comes one, something very interesting. How to do the neuron with the uh, ferroelectric. Um, when we uh, establish, uh, so I have to say one thing I didn't go into detail yet. Ferroelectric memories are out there since 30 years now. They have been brought to market by the company Ramfront, but they didn't scale very well. Today, this what, what was used to be Ramfront belongs to Premium, and they still sell uh, ferroelectric memories at the 130 nanometer node. The problem is the material that's in there, so-called PPT, is not scalable to very small dimensions. About little more than 10, almost 15 years now ago, it was discovered that also percadmium oxide, the material that is already in the more modern MOS transistor, can be made ferroelectric. When we, when we realized that, we could, could convince global boundaries to integrate that into their scaled down uh, sets. And all of a sudden, we had scaled down CPET devices available to this, which were never or a real So we looked at everything we could look at and we found very interesting defects. And one interesting defect that we found was this accumulative switching. So if you take such a small device, and remember what I just told you about these domains, this device will only have two domains, and you apply pulses which are below the coercive field. So it should actually not switch. For a few pulses, nothing happens. But if you apply more and more pulses, at a certain point, the device will fully switch. And depending on the voltage, this can be tuned. So with higher voltage, you need um, less pulses. With lower voltage, you need more pulses. And this is something that can realize the integration function of an integrate and fire neuron. And the integration in a traditional neuron made with EMOM is the the, the thing that uses the most area because you need a large capacitor and you can get completely away of this. We have shown this here by uh, simply mimicking uh, such um, uh, frequency dependent behavior. I told you that in spiking neural networks, you are coding your signal by uh, um, by the time when you when you get those spikes. So if you change the voltage that you apply here, the higher the voltage, the higher the frequency of pulses, which is exactly what we need for a neuron. So we sat together with people that know how to design neurons, and they said, yeah, that's nice, but with one uh, feedback, you might be too optimistic. They came up with different variants. This one they liked uh, uh, very much because it looks pretty close to uh, what they think a biological neuron should look, but it uses seven uh, transistors. They also came up with a solution which is quite decent that uses four transistors. And this is incredible area gain compared to a normal CMOS realization where your capacitor defines the area of the device. Finally, we 
also use uh, the tunnel junction to mimic, uh, to mimic a neuron, as shown here. I don't want to go into detail, I just want to mention the possibility and actually the effect this space here on the fact that uh, we are uh, charging just uh, an internal node here, and we use this transistor to uh, amplify this node. By this, we get away with using a too large uh, capacitor here, and we can get a decent, uh, uh, decent uh, reaction of the neuron here. This is work still in pro progress, so the concept just came up uh, last year. So uh, I hope I didn't go too much over my time, but I, I think I'm not that bad, actually. Um, uh, with this, I'm, I'm almost on the end. I just want to give you my, my key messages. So the Van Neumann bottleneck is, is one of the most pressing limitations for the performance. And we heard in the first talk that uh, in, in the wireless system, it's also about transferring too much data. And here it's more about what's happening on the chip. And also there we have to solve this issue because we need incredible amounts of uh, uh, energy in training these uh, neural networks and uh, 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 part of this energy is wasted because in a, in a, a neural network that is realized on a von Neumann machine, you don't solve that issue. Uh, performing logic and memory functions on the same location is the way to solve that. Brain-inspired computing is going one step further by mimicking parts of what we understand that the brain is doing. And what is very interesting for a device guy like me is, you heard in the previous talk about Moore's law, and you heard about scaling of transistors. For uh, uh, most of my career, I was used to getting a roadmap, and I could see in three generations we need this, in four generations we need this. So I could actually uh, tune my device and, and could focus on some details of how to make the device better, but now here the device only makes sense in the concept of the whole have everything together. This uh, requires that we're not just thinking about technology, not just about the device, not just about the design, not just about the system architecture, but we have to bring all that together already in the early stage. Uh, since non-volatile memory functionality is required, the non volatile me memories are the best uh, starting point. And personally, I don't think that anything will come out of the nowhere that is uh, much better than using a non volatile memory uh, concept and building on that. In particular, the emerging resistive switching or parallelic memory approach is uh, currently what you see the most discussed versions that uh, uh, are. Our uh, focus on here, of course, you can do many of these things also with traditional memory. They will not be as effective. However, in the emerging memories, there's still some, there's still some homework to do, and um, especially in those cases where we go to analog computing. Um, there are many, many, uh, 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 which is inherent to some of the concepts I showed. There are a lot of discussions ongoing. So many industry people say this will never lead to anything. Uh, 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 we should concentrate on using going the, the traditional dig digital way. So let's see. It's an exciting field that is just at its beginning. And this I've already mentioned. We have to move much more closer together because happy enough gaining is definitely over and on all levels uh, the interaction already has to be there in the basic research and this is something which basic researchers are definitely not used to. With this I would like to thank you and of course I'm open for discussion. Thomas, it was a really um, enthusiastic uh, presentation and convincing one also. And I, I have really appreciated your latest message, and I, I, I fully agree with you. So, uh, do you have some questions in the room? No. 
much things to uh, understand and uh, running around to, to ask questions so far, I think. Yeah, okay. okay. There is a question here. Finally. Uh, for the last example of the cognitive switching, for how long could you keep the memory? And uh, if it's needed, uh, goes in the opposite direction to. Which one? I didn't understand the question. Which few seconds we will repeat with the mic. I, I think I heard something about pulse in the other direction. And this is in, in all those cases here where we, and I understood something of the last example. So if it's about the, the two neurons, you always, of course, need a reset pulse. Yeah? I didn't mention that explicitly, but you have to have a reset uh, in between. After the firing, uh, uh, immediately you have here it's shown, here it's shown explicitly, but here it's not shown explicitly. Um, for example, for the phase change um, memories, um, could could be that mm -hmm. we can use them for the, for example, for non volatile memories. Let's say, let, for example, in the case that I'm working on with a material U2, so it has a phase transition uh, in which we observe memory if we apply. Uh, a temperature protocol, so repetitive loops until we have a, a memory accumulation of phase instead of charges. So mm -hmm. we were trying to find if we can have both non-volatile and volatile memory because so far we, we find that when we uh, rise the temperature, um, we can have resistive switching but we are trying to to combine both. So is there a material that you think or one of these examples that could be used for both non-volatile and volatile memory? So if I understood your question correct, it's about the volatility and the non-volatility of this type of concept. So first of all, let me mention the following. Uh, if you have uh, uh, this situation here, if you have an uh, amorphous layer here and you want to get a high current through and want to heat it up so it can crystallize, uh, it, it can only work because there is inherently a an, an, an volatile threshold switching effect in those calgo genomes. When, the, when, the, when this stuff was uh, um, discovered back in the 70s, there was a big, big expectation that that even could enable a full new electronic. So there's inherently always a volatile effect in there. Now the question whether you whether this device will become volatile or not volatile is: Do you give it the time to um, to uh, really uh, crystallize or not? So if I switch it off immediately again, then I I can get a current through the device. But if I don't give it enough time then uh, uh, it will just switch off again. So uh, in, normally for, for non-volatile memory, you use a, a material that would uh, switch quite fast. But depending on the stoichiometry and depending on the exact composition of those materials, you can only also have one that is quite uh, slow in switching and then it will be volatile. And if you look at the Intel Micron concept, it is, they never published anything about it, but there are a few reverse engineering studies about it. So you can see they have two, two of these devices stacked on top of each other. And it looks like it's obviously a, a, a volatile and a non-volatile one stacked on top of each other. The volatile one is the threshold switch, and the non-volatile is actually the storage device. 
So the, the reason is simply if you have such a cross point array, you want to get rid of the currents that are flowing through the uh, cells if you don't address them, which you cannot avoid if you're just crossing lines. Uh, now, one of, if I understood the question correct, the question was also, can we con combine both? This is actually what some researchers or even companies are now looking into. They say the inter micron thing was too complex, therefore the, the production cost was too high. So now we have to find a material system which can give this rectifying and uh, 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 select characteristic and, and have a non-volatile resist uh, thing as well. But there I'm not to be into yeah? Where in, in, in this type of concept yet. I haven't looked into them too much. But this is currently something uh, people are considering as more or less uh, uh, a learning out of the internal micron thing. Makes things on the material side even more complex. Did that really you answer your question or yeah, did I misunderstand it? Another question here for you, Thomas. So regarding the write and the rate of voltage across the memory switch device, uh, not memory switch, just like the general memory device, uh, as far as what I learned is like maybe they need much higher voltage to read or program those memory device, but we are working on the actual load power, if we say we will do actual load power circuit design and the voltage we get for his, uh, from design perspective is limited. So it's like if we think about a system, like maybe we need multiple supply voltage system. So maybe uh, could you make some comment on about it, like this, the supply voltage for issues? Uh, like maybe it's not issues. Uh, it's just, I, I, I can, I'm confused. Oh, no, no, that, that, that's a very important issue because in any type of memory device, um, and uh, uh, even if it's an analog switching one, but I like to explain it with this one here. If, if you do your calculations, if you do in memory computing, you want to work down here. But during the operations on the in memory computing, you don't want to change the state of the cell. So that means for programming, you necessarily have to have another operating machine. That can be either with very high current, which you could do with MM, or in most cases, it's a higher voltage. Yeah? So but uh, 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 that, that is one of the problems why, um, why people prefer to go to these uh, array-based solutions, because then, once we have the high voltage supply, and high voltage means here, let's say two to three volts. Yeah? So something that in most processes you can do with classical I.O. devices, not like in traditional flash memories where you really need separate high voltage devices capable of 10 or in NAND flash even of 20 volts. So we're talking about two to three volts. But that's why people prefer this, because in the non-volatile logic, you still need your programming circuit and you need your separate wiring for your programming circuit. And then you really have to look close how, how efficient can it be. Probably the non-volatile logic will still locally have some small array structure. Yeah, but uh, it, it's much easier to achieve in the in memory uh, in the in the uh, memory array. Uh, but inherently, I don't, I don't see any chance of, of avoiding this because the, the system doesn't know uh, uh, whether we intend to program it or whether we intend to read it. And that's why there must be some differentiator. There must be a different stimulus. So the stimulus for programming cannot be the same as we use for the reading or the logic operation. Yeah? This, this is one of the key issues that we have to deal with in all these concepts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's like the memory device programming part, read or write, and also the circuit part, let's say they maybe need two different supply voltages to, to make it uh, pop. Are you good? So it's well, like... Definitely the, 
the, ch the chips definitely need a higher voltage, whether you need a supply voltage from outside or whether you integrate charge pumps at this uh, very normal in, in, um, in non-volatile memory is, is uh, dependent on the system requirement. Yeah, but, but you have to have uh, uh, the, also the devices that can handle that in your process. That's the important thing. So in the processes that we have integrated those key things in the in the last years, we could always use the uh, I/O devices that were already available. We didn't have to invent anything new. Okay, guys. Thank you. And we have other questions for Thomas. Okay, let's thank again, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to transfer the host again. Yeah, please. Okay, so the next speaker is Alice, and it will be again on another type of uh, device. So Alice is coming from France in Saclay. So her um, laboratory is uh, UMP, so uh, collaboration between uh, Thales and CNRS in France. Very specific. Yes. <laughs> and I think she, she will explain a little bit more than me. So can everyone hear me? Uh, is it fine for the Zoom also? Oh, yes, it's directly that time. Okay, uh, great. So, yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, for having me. It was a really uh, a great opportunity to be in the lovely border. Uh, and um, so, indeed, our lab is a um, joint laboratory between the industry and academics. Uh, I have a PDF if you have an issue. Yeah. <laughs> Déjà là, on va mettre la, la présentation, non La présentation, ça c'est une clé USB. Oui, mais elle est où
Si tu ne peux pas retaper le portail, tu peux me la donner rapidement. Ah, mais ça, c'est bien tout. Je vais tenter de faire la France. I think everyone needed a break anyway. Back again. 